Okay, now that we've done a quick intro on uh, access controls and uh, we've also talked about data classification, it's time to bring it all home and link the two topics together and then talk about some of those considerations that you're going to have in terms of access control to information and uh, facilities and then data classification. So in this particular case, if you've got an information asset and it has a, a uh, data classification, you've got to look at you know the storage of that, the when it's in transit, and um, uh, when it's being processed. How do you protect that information? You're going to have to mark it, um, and uh, uh, there are different ways of actually doing this. Does this sound like the CNSS model? It should. There is a linkage there. So as you look at this data classification, if you've got something that's data classified above unclassified or uh, above open records within uh, University System of Georgia then you're going to have to manage that information and mark it. And that classification has to be very clear and make sure that it's only available to um, authorized users. Uh, some folks, if you're working in a classified environment, are going to uh, implement a clean desk policy, which means when you go home, you can't have any classified information out. If you do, then you're going to have to harden access to that. So you're going to have to have a safe there. You're going to have to have what in, in the military is called a skiff you know, where you've got it uh, very hardened uh, against someone accidentally uh, coming across that information. That gets very expensive. So again, lots of considerations to think about when you start to classify data uh, within your uh, company or your organization. All right, we're now going to go and uh, look at uh, how you destroy it. So uh, I think I've given this example, uh, but I used to work in a SCIF facility, a special compartmented information facility. Uh, and at that time, if you brought any technology in, uh, then at the end of the week, we'd, we'd thank you. And then we'd destroy it. We'd actually melt it using thermite grenades. And thermite grenades are actually a sheet of material and just melt straight down. Uh, but we were very serious about destroying anything that may be uh, contain classified uh, information. It's the same with all of the uh, paper products that we were using. They had to be utterly destroyed, completely destroyed, um, on a weekly basis so as to limit uh, the uh, exposure of that particular information. All right, let's talk a little bit more now about data classification and uh, uh, how that applies and uh, again this is an example from the military but for the military they actually would put cover documents on anything so the first thing that you would see if you were walking by somebody's desk would be the cover document and then you would know inside that document would be in this case either confidential secret or for official use uh, data um, and again that kind of led to how do you protect the information within your company and this was a paper-based product uh, or, or, or system. You have to implement uh, electronic systems uh, today. Most of our information is stored electronically. How do you uh, protect that? If you look again to the military, they actually run multiple networks uh, that control access to this information. So there's one network they call NipperNet which is the non-classified internet and that has all of their non-classified data on it. And they run another network called SIPRNET, or Secret Internet. And the SIPRNET has all of their classified information uh, on it. And if you'll look into the press, uh, in terms of uh, the, the recent examples where we've had disclosures of classified information from the military, um, it's where there has been someone who had authorized access to SIPRNET but then uh, copy down information that they were not authorized to copy down and, to sh and they shared the information uh, in, a non, uh, uh, in, in a way that they were not authorized uh, to do. All right, let's continue to move forward. We've given you some examples of access control. We've talked about in this particular slide uh, classification and then uh, I've talked a little bit about in the military how they've done uh, SIPRNET and, and uh, NIPRNET. Uh, to provide uh, those uh, access control classifications. Let's now look at what's called latest-based access control. And so this is going to be a, var a variation of mandatory access control. And what you're doing is just assigning a matrix of authorizations for particular areas. And then 
again, different people may have access to different components, need to know, remember that. And uh, so this gives you some structure between people and objects and what the classification and what their access is to that information and how do you store that uh, uh, electronically. Um, uh, this latest base uh, access controls is an example of a non-discretionary control. You don't, you don't have any option in terms of uh, what you're going to do. And what this particular slide suggests is you can do this role-based or task-based um, based on the, the, the user's role or the tasks that are at hand uh, within that organization. All right, we've uh, talked a good bit now about some of the more classical forms of access control. What I'm going to do now is move into discretionary access control. And the important part on discretionary access control is mo that, that, that third bullet. Most personal computer operating systems are using this. So uh, there's an administrator. That administrator can um, uh, access on a discretionary basis uh, access controls to certain um, uh, objects uh, within that and can run those at different permission levels. Okay, And so uh, the discretionary access control is rule-based. Remember when we were talking about access control lists? Oh, it seems so long ago, but we did. Uh, this is an example of that where you've got some access control lists that are built against particular objects and then actually uh, using those. All right, well, let's go ahead and finish up uh, this video. We've talked about discretionary access controls and how they link to personal computers. We've talked about non-discretionary access controls uh, and how they link, and we've uh, talked about some uh, security levels. Let's look at some other forms of access controls, and it, it's interesting. There are three short bullets here, but they're really powerful. Um, so, and I'm going to do it in reverse order to keep you awake. So we're going to do the temporal time-based, and what this basically says is you're going to use time to associate when people can and cannot access information. And actually, a lot of the web-based, you know, if you're trying to protect your children from getting on the internet or going to particular websites at a certain time, um, these temporal-based uh, access controls have been commercially implemented and have been used and have found their way actually into some of the operating systems. Uh, so just something to consider. It's another way of maintaining access control. It may be that your facility processes classified data between 8 and 5, and you don't want any of those systems accessed after 5 o'clock. You literally want to lock them down. And so you can put some uh, temporal access controls in place. Uh, constrained user interfaces, another thing that's uh, commonly used, or at least we use it within the University System of Georgia. And so you're going to get different user interfaces based on what your role is or where you're coming from. Uh, so if you're coming from the great American public and you're accessing our public website, you're going to see certain things. And if you're coming from one of our institutions, you're going to see other things. So you're, you're providing uh, a different type of constrained user interface, and it kind of links into the content dependent. It, it, it's really based on what your role is, is going to depend on what you're going to see within a particular interface. And again, this is used very commonly uh, on World Wide Web uh, uh, sites that are role based. You, depending on what your role is, you're going to see different things. All right, well, this concludes our kind of look at access controls where we linked data classification with access controls and looked at some considerations that you need to make to uh, implement access controls. We're going to finish up on access controls right here, and we're now going to start moving into uh, security architecture models, look at some basics, and then look at some actual uh, historical models and start to work through those. So see you in the next video where we're going to, uh, uh, or at least you can hear me in the next video, as we talk about security architecture models.